Namaste and in La Ketch and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and this week's guest is Guy Morris. Now, Guy has this just phenomenal travel through life, a journey through life, and the things that he's done, where he's been, starting out as a 13-year-old runaway, getting multiple degrees, working in the high-tech industry for major corporations, and then getting now into his authoring of books that take what he learned from working in that high-tech AI software industry and what we may not have been aware of, and bringing that to light through his books. Guy, I'm glad to have you here. Zen, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. I'm excited to talk to you today. So I, in that excitement, what does, as a child, as you were thinking back, what excited you in how to explore life as a kid? Well, as a, as a child, I, 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 there's a lot of my childhood that's kind of um, lost through a level of amnesia. I, I was mm -hmm. fairly traumatized as a child through a lot of violence, a lot of addiction, a lot of um, neglect. Um, and I try not to talk about those experiences per se. I, I what do got you through those, though? Because obviously you're here, you made it. What were the things that you um, held inside that got you through that? I didn't want my past to define my future. Okay. I, I wanted to, um, th there was a there was a movie out called A Knight's Tale a number of years ago, and mm -hmm. Keith Ledger in it, and one of the lines in that movie resonated with me uh, really deeply, which is I wanted to change my stars. And I, 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 I loved adventure, I loved exploring. Uh, I do remember a time when we lived in Honolulu, and uh, my favorite times in Honolulu were, there was a volcanic crater that had turned into a volcanic lake behind our house. Mm. And it was extremely steep and treacherous and dangerous. Um, but uh, you couldn't keep me from exploring the things that the unknown in that yeah, sense. You're just and, driven and to explore, right? I, I really was. It's got me into trouble a few times. Um, but As yeah, it will. It will. Um, <laughs> because, and, and you're, it's, but it, sometimes it's that sense of, impending danger that raises elevates your your adrenaline and elevates your awareness that life is life is short and it's how we live it not how long right. we live it now does that affect your curiosity level or does it uh, does it diminish it or or does it actually um, work as an attenuator for it uh, it, uh, it certainly i was always curious um and i was i i always felt that that I could, I, I wanted to just expand the boundaries that I had. I, I wanted to get out of my, my, my home environment. I wanted to get out of the environment I was in. I wanted to really find out what was really going on in the world and how it worked and what was, and, and, and how I could fit in it. And, and I wasn't aware at first that I wanted to make a difference as much as I just wanted to, I wanted to embrace what was out there that I didn't know. And, um, uh, there was a, another time when I actually, uh, and I, um, running away um, became, was one of the most terrifying things at age 13, was one of the most terrifying things I'd ever done, but was one of the most, yeah. the most terrifying thing anybody could do, right? Is just to leave everything behind, go out on your own and not know what to expect. Well, and, and at the time, there was a, a thought in me that no matter what happened to me, no matter how bad it could get, it couldn't be worse than what I was already living through. And, but at least I would, if I was going to fail, I was going to do it on my own terms. Mm -hmm. but do you think that gave you a little sense of fearlessness in the process? Oh, I was terrified. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know but, that. Was and yet still you did. But so I was, it, it would seem like that fearlessness, unbeknownst, right, drove you beyond the fear, the, the fearfulness. It did give me the sense that that I had to, I, I didn't want fear to be my, 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 my leash. Mm -hmm. That um, what it did teach me that as terrified as I was and as miserable as I was much of the time during that period, I survived. I survived with a level of tenacity. 
I survived with a level of humility by being willing to, I, my, my, I ate by going right alongside the migrant workers as they were picked up at five in the morning and shipped into ranches around California to do dirty, nasty work for 15 hour days and come home exhausted only to get up a few hours later and do it again. Mm -hmm. And I learned that, um, that as, as difficult as it was, as hard as it was, as lonely as it was, I, I could survive, I could take care of myself. And I didn't, I, 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 I broke that reliance of saying, well, I need somebody else to do it for me. Right. And, and you broke and, it very early in life. And, and that was, that was a, a, and I wanted, I got my GED a couple of years later at age 15 and mainly because not because I had completed all my academics, but because of all the work credits I had at California at the time gave you a GED based on those, gave you credit for those, that, those work hours. And I had so many work hours by the age of 15, I could graduate. So I did and, and left home for good and um, spent the next few years doing um, more hard labor, um, um, parking cars, driving produce trucks, uh, digging ditches for an Amish um, construction worker who was a contractor. Um, and um, now when you're doing this, so it, it, as excruciating as it must have been because of not just the work, the time, the and the humbling nature, right? What was going on in, in your head during this as far as looking for the next step or planning or even envisioning creating that environment that you wanted to step into, if you even knew? Right? Or was it just a well, I, temporary and transitory move toward the next? I had accepted Christ um, while I was homeless in a dirty street gutter, um, sitting in a dirty street gutter with with what would be now called that there's a new movie out called the Jesus revolution, basically a hippie at the time. Mm. And, um, and, and it was something I, I immediately gravitated to because it spoke to spiritual truths that were, there was none of that in my home. We were, they were very, uh, atheistic. I, I people said, well, did you ever grow up in church? I said, no, I grew up in bars, um, uh, with very violent, ugly people. Um, and it it gave me the sense that there was um a there were spiritual truths and there there was a genuine sense of love and community outside of the things that i had grown up to know mm -hmm. and so and i was a musician i i wasn't really a good musician i to be to be honest with you but i had, I had um uh, one of the things i did when i was on my own was i hitchhiked to tijuana um, and bought a little tiny Spanish guitar, toy, basically a toy guitar in a, in a cardboard box and taught myself to play and started writing songs. And, and songwriting was really a way of me sort of finding a way of expressing some of the things I had gone through, was going through in, in a way that I, I, could, I could somehow be concise with. And so there was a sense in me at the time when I was doing all these other things that my, my destiny would somehow be involved in music or would some have, maybe it might be involved in a church or missionary work or something like that. I really wasn't sure. Did you notice when you were writing the songs and, and putting them together, as you mentioned, it was a way of saying things concisely. Did you recognize your own processing in process as you were doing that? It was, well, at the time, it was, I was, it was a learning process, right? It, I was learning how to play music. I was learning how to write music. I was learning how to bring ideas or feelings into something that I could express. And it was, I was, I was looking at others that I admired at the time and, and trying to emulate that. So, so it, it sounds to me like you're talking about, about this, exactly the, this inner reflection of what you were seeing in the world and how you were processing it through your music and your activities and and that contemplative state i, I was actually I, I was aware that i i did have a a uh, active level of trying to understand my the world understand my experiences and put them into a context in in somewhat of a positive way i didn't want to be one of the i i the, one of the people who wrote songs whining all the time Right, right. I wanted to, I wanted to have, I wanted to somehow just as leaving home was terrifying, but I, I came out okay. I wanted to somehow re reflect that 
survivor mentality. Well, that, and you seem that, to have that, you know, that, that uh, aspirational quality of knowing something greater was available and looking at life through that lens in a hopeful way rather than carrying the trauma with you. And it was all rudimentary. I was actually yeah. still functionally illiterate at the time. I, I couldn't really read a newspaper fully. I, I had trouble relating to a lot of things. But I, I didn't like the idea that there was so much of the world and, and I just really didn't understand how it worked. Mm -hmm. um, now, what happened a few years after that, I was by that point, by the time I was 19, I had already gotten married. I'd married way too young um in retrospect and and my first wife got pregnant right away so we ha i had a toddler i was still working really long hours uh six days a week and um uh, it was actually in a, a time of prayer i was actually praying to say geez should i send my wife back to work for a little while just so i can quit my job long enough to find another job i just needed to find another job but i, I needed income i needed money i had to pay the rent and I couldn't, I was working 12 hour plus days, um, six days a week. And there just wasn't time to go interview or even apply or do anything else. And in that time of prayer, I felt it was one of the few times in my life where I felt very, very strongly that I was hearing something that had come completely outside of myself. Mm -hmm. And it basically said, I want you to go to college. And at the time, I'm thinking, I've switched wavelengths with somebody. I said, I, I didn't yeah, barely, I never an SAT yeah. score. I barely passed high school. I just got a GED because I work hard. I said, this is obviously meant for some, I, I said, this is weird. And I went back and, and I got it even stronger. I says, I want you to get up right now. I want you to go to the phone. I want you to call the university. I want you to ask for an application. You're going to go to college. Now, this to me was also terrifying. Because I, I felt that it would just be an exercise in me being rejected, right? Because there, and it was the beginning of August. School started in like three or four weeks, or maybe it was the end of July. But it was like a it was like a month or so before even school started. Said, this is insane. Yeah. I said, I'm, I'm a dummy. And, and I was told my entire life I was a dummy. That and I said, well, there's no way this is going to happen. Long story short. A few weeks later, I had to get my transcripts. It was the first time when I got my transcripts that I realized I had gone to 16 schools before before I dropped out in the 10th grade, and I missed most of the ninth grade, and um, and I couldn't remember two thirds of the schools. I, I that was one of the first realization that I had lost. I had lost a big part of my childhood. Yeah, it'd be quite shocking. Um, but anyway, they let me in. And I, and I was, even though I was like a year and a half or two years deficient from the minimum requirements, they said I was allowed to make them up as I, as I went. And my first thought when I got the letter back was like, holy cow, I thought school was for smarts people who worked really hard in high school. They'll let anybody in. I said, my gosh, this is, this is sad, you know. Not realizing that divine thread that was in it and the, you know, your listening, which turned into action which was driven by yeah. well i threw the letter away because i said well it was like at the time it was five thousand dollars tuition uh, i didn't have five thousand dollars you know now five thousand today is really cheap you know but at the time it was a fortune sure and there was i i couldn't even i was trying still trying to figure out how to pay the rent and and, and get a, a job that wasn't beating me up to the pulp so I threw it away. Well, the very next day, I got a separate letter from my father-in-law, and, and I had told nobody I was doing this because I was I was I was kind of ashamed of the fact that I was I was doing this weird, stupid thing that had no chance of success. <laughs> and and, and yet yeah, you were doing it. He he basically said, "I'm concerned about the welfare of my daughter. I think that you um, I, I want her to you you to be able to make enough that will support her in a way that she deserves." I says, I'm willing to consider paying your tuition and books if you're willing to work, do work to basically serve for your survival and consider going back to college. And I says, I know that you've had a, um, uh, a disadvantaged childhood and um, I can't remember the word he used, but um, he said, would you consider this? And, and my first thought was reading this letter was, oh my gosh, this is the universe telling me that this is what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, it would seem and that so way. And so I, I, I said, did we take the traps out yet? 
<laughs> I think I need that letter. So I, I pulled it out. It had some stains on it and everything else, but it gave me the, the ability to go. So I started the college and, and honestly, I, I struggled. I, I had to pick a, 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 I needed my wife's help even to fill out the application. Um, because I, I was, I, I just didn't know how to interpret everything. I had to write an essay. I didn't know how to do that. And I had to pick a major. So I close my eyes and I point and it comes up with electrical engineering. And I'm like, okay, so what does an electrical engineer do? Um, I, it was a, it was a bizarre experience of just closing your eyes and leaping off the cliff and hoping that you're going to land without splattering. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that being said, I want to ask you a question. The possibility, so recognizing the voice, the synchronicities, the events that open the doors, mm -hmm. your sense, now would you say that there is a, and uh, I'm hesitant to call it anything other than a, uh, a great architect or an intelligence that listens and responds depending on how you really become um, I generally, available to it. I generally believe that God had a plan for me and he was pushing me in that direction if I would just be obedient. Now, was this plan also embedded in you from the beginning and it was just now starting to unfold? I actually had been told my entire life that I was stupid and that if I, my best hope my best well, I understand that would be to I'm talking trade. from the possibility of the, I've the never really out. conceived myself as a as a college type I, I would wouldn't even I didn't even know what kind of academic to study I, I really had no ambition in that direction um, but yet when this happened I, I developed a sense of this is going to radically change my life I I, I had wanted to escape poverty and I realized that I now had a path to do that. Mm -hmm. And not just escape poverty, but to escape ignorance. And um, and and I I even though the first few years in college I was struggling to pass get passing grades, I worked as if my life depended on it, because in my own mind, my whole life depended on me not giving up because it was tough right now somewhere around my second or third year something happened i'm not exactly sure what but things started clicking and um i started getting faster at being able to read i maybe it was the ability to read i i, I okay. but i started understanding things and i started asking questions and i i started asking the kinds of questions that a professor would give a lecture and my economics class was one of the best examples i got to the point where i asked so many different insightful questions the professor would basically get derailed from the whole class curriculum he finally said to me okay you get three questions per class Three. That's all you get. No more. No, you know, you, you can, if you get more than three, I'm just going to ignore you. They said, and so if I would raise my hand, he would say, okay, you're on number two. Are you sure this is one you want to ask or you want to wait? Uh, and, and so I started becoming very inquisitive about trying to, trying to put these things together and say, well, now, wait a minute, what about this? And wait a minute, what about that? And how does this fit in? And would this, wouldn't this mean this? And wouldn't this mean that? And, and um, it was like, it was like I was come. It was like my intellect was coming alive for the first time in my life, mm -hmm. and it was an exciting time. But also, uh, I wasn't sure what to make of it. I was just, I was just going with the flow. I was just trying to pass. And at a certain point, I, I had finally got to the toward. I earned a couple. Of, I was basically on track to earning uh, two different degrees in my undergraduate uh, with a third minor. And um, I had worked myself so hard that I got sick and I was in, in bed for about four months, which set me back a little bit. Wow. Um, what was it that, was it the stress factor that... that I think the stress, was? the fact that I would probably, I got roughly about four hours sleep for about five years a night. So I was just working myself to the bone. Because uh, I still had to go work a part-time job in order to pay, pay rent and buy for food. Mm -hmm. So I was taking a 22, 24 unit credit units of, of class plus, you know, um, going to work plus 
uh, taking care of my toddler because my wife was anorexic and she was sick. Um, you know, I, I, and I just was working constantly. And I think I just wore myself down uh, to some extent. I got valley fever, which mm -hmm. most people don't know what that is, but you're in Arizona, you know. Yep. Um, yeah, and, it's debilitating. Um, it, it was debilitating for about four months. And I, I, I was terrified that I had worked that hard to basically fail right at the end. But I, I pushed myself through. I still graduated. I, gra I had to go. I didn't graduate in June with everybody else. I had to go through the summer to make up for what I, I had missed, but I still graduated. And I had made a bet with my professor, um, the one that I irritated all the time. And he was also the dean of the, the business college. And so I said, well, if one of the things we had to do to graduate was to build a macroeconomic model. This is basically a, uh, an, uh, an algorithm, set of algorithms that there was a, about 15 or 20 of them as the minimum model that we had to build. And we had to predict the GNP. We had to predict unemployment. We had to predict the interest rate, which were all the key real indicators in the economy at the time. Mm -hmm. And who the the way he graded it was whoever was closest to the actual numbers they got the a and the farther away you were from the actual numbers was how your grades went and um and I, and i really wanted to go to grad school i was i was now in love with the process of learning and i was inspired by men of the renaissance who were not just artists but they were business people and scientists and architects and 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 doused in religion so they were extremely well-rounded individuals in that sense and that well-roundedness allowed them to see all aspects of their life with a um clearer and broader lens you know and, and it some, allows you to observe life as much as be a, as be a participant in it right and we see artists today who are just artists and and there's a one dimensionality to what they're doing as opposed to men of the Renaissance who were extremely deep in all these things. And that inspired me. So I wanted to go to grad school, but I was out of money. The person, my father-in-law who had, had offered to help me out was uh, in a coma uh, at the time. And the, the rest of the family thought that I was just nothing but a leech. And, and I was taking money that they wanted to inherit. Sure. And, um, so I, I knew I couldn't count on that anymore. So I, I made a deal. I said, well, if I can beat everybody else in the school, would you consider me for a, a scholarship? Well, I spent, um, I, I pulled out the stops. I, I had a theory that was an unproven theory um, of, about productivity of technology impacting things and, and as it, acting as an accelerator to the economy. But nobody had else had developed any of these theories. There were, were no algorithms. Nobody else were, were thinking about these things. So I had to develop that myself. And so I spent every night from about midnight to about 8 a.m. Uh, in the data center because that was the only time I could get unfree access to the data center. Uh, because everybody else was, all the smart people were sleeping or partying. <laughs> and, uh, but as it turned out, I not only beat everybody in the school, but I beat the Federal Reserve. I beat the Horton School of Business. I built the, beat the Northwestern School of Business. I beat all of the national banks uh, and by a long shot. I was one-tenth of one percent off of the numbers for two quarters in a row. Which made you very attractive instantly. Not only did I get my scholarship, um, that I took, I was accepted into Harvard, which I didn't take because it meant a whole level of financing and money that I didn't have to go there because I didn't get a scholarship at Harvard or I would have gone there. Mm -hmm. But I was also, I was in Arizona at the time. And, and, you know, for me, as you know, 70 degrees meant it was dead winter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the, the, looking at some of the pictures of, of, of Boston and, and the kind of snow and ice that they got, I was just like, no, no, no. <laughs> um, so but, UOA was a better choice. Well, for me at the time, and yeah. I, it meant moving my family and, and a whole new, uh, an investment in wardrobe that we didn't have. It just, it was just impractical for me at the time. And, and later on in life, I regret it, not doing it, not finding a way, taking out a loan, doing something like that to do it. But um you know, well, uh, even so, it sure seems like you were able to take advantage of that and move into some areas that few travel. Well, it got me my first job at IBM and allowed me to really, it, it, it set the, the template for um, thinking outside the box, being an innovator, being willing to take risks that others 
were when others were really just trying to play it safe to get that next job. And I, I, I can't count the times I was told that, okay, guy, we'll let you do this, but you realize this is a career making, this is a career decision. If you fail, that'll probably be it right for you here. Um, you It would seem, from my perspective, in, in just hearing what you had gone through previous to that, that challenge, the because of the fright and all the extraneous emotions that you'd had to deal with prior to this, and now you're having that momentum in the flow of how your life's going, it would seem like, yeah, you know, it's like, I got to do this. That's that I, I, I felt I had to. I felt yeah. that was what I was made to do. And that if I was going to fail, I was going to fail on my own terms. And, um, and, and there were times I did fail, but um, never very few times were they catastrophic failures. Now, on an emotional level, though, um, I carried be not only with the stress of all these very stressful jobs and uh, career and, and the pressure that that took, but my uh, social and emotional life suffered greatly. Uh, in part because I lack of energy, and in part because I really didn't. But you weren't there I mean, <laughs> with the hours in school and work. I, I it was. Um, my marriage fell apart. Um, I I lost. Uh, I had. I got divorced uh, um, uh, fairly young. Um, I had two children at the time. That was and an indeed. emotional blow for me. Um, yeah, I experienced and, that as well. I suffered from addiction. Uh, I said su I suffered from chronic depression. I suffered from hyper anxiety. Um, it took me, uh, even though I, I I was really good at being the guy who would sit in the in his office till way wee hours in the night, working on something that I, I, I would hope would be seen as brilliant, but I wasn't good at necessarily building relationships and friendships and 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 building that social foundation that that really helped others achieve um higher up in the organization leadership roles one step at a time and 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 so i after my divorce i had to go through a time of, of of dealing um it took me a while before i could deal with my my alcoholism it took me i had to go through 12 strips i had to i had to I realized that the, the, the emotional, my emotional failings and, and, and um, flaws were holding me back from really who I wanted to be. And I, I wanted to be somebody different than that guy. And, and I want, I didn't want, that was, to me, that was still part of my past. It reminded it, I kept saying, I don't want to become my mother. I don't want to become my stepdad. I, I needed to find a way to get beyond that. And so I had to pull back a little bit so I could focus on reaching a place of, of mental health, reaching a place of emotional health, um, and, and focusing and balancing out the stress with doing something artistic, going back and rediscovering. I did for a number of years, I, I played no guitar at all, mm -hmm. uh, because there just wasn't time. And, and so I had to, I had to focus on a way to find more balance and that took that process took several years was there a particular series of questions or thoughts that you would have that you used as, as a pattern or or habit to assess the the stages of your own growth when when you were in those places of angst and looking for you know ways to make the, the next best or better choice you know, in spite of the things that I had already achieved, there was a, there was an internal voice in me that said that I was a poser. That if if only the executives knew that I was addicted. Oh man! All of this you, wait, the imposter syndrome has so much play today; it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and and that if they if they only knew how depressed and terrified I was all the time of everything. Sure. And many are, many go through that same thing and they put this exterior front up that, oh, everything's okay. And, you know, and, and they appear to be normal. And yet there's this I was afraid cauldron of that goes discovered. on inside of them. There was a terror. I was terrified of being discovered. Hmm. And, and, and my, my intellect was genuine. 
my hard work was genuine. Um, and, and, but I was able to learn to act good enough while at work and within that environment that I could, I could fool most people that I was okay. I was just driven, right? They would say, oh, he's just driven. Right. One guy at my- Didn't really feel like you deserved it yet, right? I didn't feel like I deserved it, no. And, and uh, there was a guy at Microsoft who said, you're one of the scary smart people. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there's a certain part of insecurity that keeps us humble. And yet the flip side of that is it does make us feel like the, uh, it does broach the imposter syndrome. Yeah. And the reality is that you're far greater, greater than what you believe yourself to be. And it took me, it, that was a journey to discover in and of itself. Mm. And I, I, cause I, I, there was a part of me that particularly after my divorce and, um, it, it, it reinforced, um, all of the negativity of my childhood. And, um, and I had to, I had to, I couldn't feel really good about myself as, as long as I was carrying some of that baggage. Sure. So I had to find a way to deal with that baggage. And it was partly in, in, in through my faith. It was partly through seeking out um, therapy and counselors and, and, and things of that nature. It was partly in trying to explore, realize that life wasn't just about work. And, and that was when I, I bought a boat and, and started diving and, and started, uh, and I earned a char Coast Guard charter captain license because I wanted to be able to charter out my boat and take people out. And, uh, and, and it wasn't, it was learning how to record and I started writing songs for Disney and it was trying to, ex part of it was trying to explore that, that, um, you know, there's, there's studies in that, that our brain has two hemispheres and that if we, if we only focus on one hemisphere, we become imbalanced in our, our, our perspectives of the, of the world. And I want, I was, I was trying to intentionally round out the, all of the analytical work that was being done on the right side of my brain with some of the, with trying to build up my ability to be more intuitive and creative and sensitive and in, in touch with other people on the left side. You know, it's interesting the, in that right, left hemisphere, the, and you mentioned the intuitive nature as well as the analytical. And I find it really interesting that we kind of overlook some some really simple things in, in the brain construct and, and the pineal and, hypo, and hypothalamus are both part of the the chakra system and the corpus callosum is the membrane in between the two hemispheres mm -hmm. hypothalamus sits at the bottom of the corpus callosum and the pineal sits at the top yeah so these are interesting perspectives to understand, well, maybe the, and I don't know how this conscious effort to ignite and explore would be like in process. However, it seems to make sense that that transceiver with the corpus callosum, because that's the one, that's the, where the exchange of information takes place and how it's translated into each hemisphere, as I understand it. And then you've got the hypothalamus on the bottom, the pineal at the top, managing other, uh, for lack of better, energy systems mm -hmm. that then impact our uh, ac neurochemistry activity. Right. So there's just, and I don't know that it has any particular significance other than just the consideration of, you know, the more understanding of how the brain works and, and, the things in it to help it do so right. as we understand more of ourselves and, and step into that flow that you've been talking about that you've I'm sure recognized that it's the acquiescing to it it's the um in scriptural terms I guess it's part of what submission is yeah. well and that was part of it I realized that I, I going back to that inspiration from men of the renaissance i realized that I, I had ignored my spirituality i had ignored my creativity i had ignored people i had ignored any sense of having i had reached a level of success but i wasn't really spending any time enjoying any of it hmm. um and i i wasn't exploring the world anymore i wasn't the things that were uh, had been a part of me the things that i loved as a child i had 
basically subjugate it to the the transition I had to make to build my intellect up where I could build a, a living for myself. You know, it's funny. Now I'm 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 just gonna throw this um guess out that this was in your mid 40s uh actually i started dealing with these things in my uh i i divorced in my late 20s because i had married so young um and it was in my early uh, mid 30s that i went started going dealing with my alcoholism and then i bought the right. boat and i started trying to make that transition and realizing that i i needed to balance out my work with life and and uh, and i needed to figure out what that meant because it was that in itself was an exploration that i wasn't sure how to do um but i allowed myself to rather than just say oh i enjoy sailing i tended to be immersive so i said well i'm i'm gonna buy i'm gonna move from this my condo and take my son with me and I was going to buy a really large boat and we were going to live on the boat and we were going to have an unusual life experience so that we can immerse ourselves in that. Mm -hmm. So, um, I wanted to be able to come home from a stressful day at work untie the boat and just go out and sit on the bay for a few hours and watch the sunset from there. And I started trying to, and I became a more immersive in, in playing music on a frequent basis. I joined a worship band. I, I work, one of my friends had a recording studio. And so we would go in there often. I, uh, and so. Are you um, with the Gaither Trio by chance? Beg your pardon? The Gaither Trio. I've heard of them. Yeah, I know them. Um, they're from my hometown. Uh, Danny's son, Nick, played bass for a band that I played drums for. And we were a Houston rock band at, at, at the time and, and we were, had a lot of support from the Gaithers. All those parts of the brain, musical is very mathematical, but it's also very mm -hmm. emotional. Well, and it helped basically bridge that gap between the two, the two hemispheres. I mentioned my wife being from St. Petersburg earlier. She was, this is the interesting thing I found about the Russian educational system. They tap kids when they're young, younger. They assess they, uh, their their ability, their aptitude, their skill set, and then they put them on a track to, for learning. At five years old, she chose piano. She had the choice between gymnastics and piano. She chose piano. So she was on that track all through school, graduated from a conservatory as a world-class pianist now, mm -hmm. and or was then, and, and played, you know, company Brizhnikov and some of the Russian ballet oh, nice. groups when they came through um, UC Irvine. And and she was recosted. So it, yes, the, the the music, the hemispheres, the uh, you know, she was trained early with the solfeggio tones. Where now these are things that are just coming out in the uh, uh, American music scene, if you will. And these kinds of things, the the way that the Russians treat their children and educate them is far different than the diminished capacity that we have for students in America. Right, right. Because they're not treated that way at well, all. Well, honestly, I was self-taught. So I wasn't, I was never that accomplished. Um, but that seems to be the, the way to get beyond the uh, deficits in the system. Yeah. You, you know what you want to learn. You go after it and you figure out how to do so. And I, I, was, in, I, I, was, in, I was more inspired by many of the rock musicians from the L.A. Uh, um, framework at the time. <laughs> oh, yeah, you had plenty there. Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and the Eagles, and, and um, James Jackson Brown, and um, obviously the Beatles inspired just about everybody, um, Tom Petty. And so there was a part of that, all of that, that was more influencing me musically. Um, and um, it wasn't as much about... I had a really good job. I wasn't looking for a change in career. I was looking for a more balanced life. And to be happy. And and to find that find those inner senses of joys that could that mm -hmm. could soften the stress of having to perform for CXOs and VPs and, mm -hmm. and take those career risking decisions. Sure. Now the, the <laughs> nice segue. The career risking decisions, all right. So you went on into a really intense um, initial development process with AI and the software and the things, yeah. and you were really working with some high level, globally affecting software programs. And 
I'll, I'll, at the t I, it started when I was with an oil company. I had left IBM and Burroughs at that point, and 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 I had to be. I was essentially an evangelist for technology to solve operational issues, and so I was. I was actually the first person in the entire company, outside of a couple of people in IT and executives, to get a personal computer. And because I had promised that I, if I they did that, I could transform the way they did operational budgeting and that was a success and then I was I said well now they, then they get put me in charge of their global uh, um, auditing group and and there I had to communicate with people on all the continents but there was a lot of risk in sending letters or doing phone calls because they were always tapped mm -hmm. and so I set up networks and used computers computing technology and basic the early stages of what was the uh, ARPNET at the time to basically do communications across the borders. Um, and then I, I implemented uh, an early stage of artificial intelligence. At the time, it was called knowledge ex expert knowledge systems and helped develop and, and program those. And so I, it started me, it kept me on that path. It got me re in touch with that sense that I had in college of saying, I could use technology to explore new areas, to basically mm -hmm. to move the boundaries. I wanted to move the boundaries. I, I didn't want to be constrained by, I, I, I would always go into a new group and it would, I'd always hear the, oh, we can't do that because. I said, well, then that sounds like the thing we need to solve. Let's solve exactly. that problem. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, and you have the attitude, the, I don't know what it can't do. Let's try it. Then, then if, if that's our boundary, if that's what's holding us back, then let's solve that problem. And then that won't be a boundary anymore. Right. And so uh, it... I, why do you think that kind of thinking is not so present in uh, the challenge situation? You know, I, I have another, uh, one of my prior guests uh, talks about the ambidextrous organization where... Mm -hmm. You know, you spend time exploiting, but you don't look at experimenting yeah. uh, or exploring. Right. It's so how the, you're talking about finding that balance in that. I'd, well, uh, and I, I realized uh, part of that was also a, a process of realization. Now, in college, I had somewhat idealized our economy, our economic systems, our corporate environments, but they were changing. Mm -hmm. and, and changing in part because of political um, um, pressures and, and greed uh, and avarice. And so I was actually, I had, as part of the oil company, I, had, was, um, I, I was responsible for approving um, all major capital investments, including environmental rep, uh, um, rep, rep, reparations uh, under the EPA edicts. Um, and, and so I was in the boardroom uh, at, during the time when we had some of our own scientists, some of our own geologists were coming to basically present what was what would then become climate change studies. Mm -hmm. um, and we they were just simply talking about the decrease in ice sheets in the Arctic Sea relative and correlating that to levels of CO2 in the atmosphere and, and, and fossil fuel emissions. And I was in the boardroom when when they started presenting this, it was the first time they had presented it and I had encouraged them to present it. Um, and when I watched the chairman of the board fly into a red face spittle tirade, uh, spittle spitting tirade about how this doesn't sell oil and that we sell oil and anybody wants to bring this topic up again, they're gonna be fired. Mm. And it was the first inclination that I had that corporations weren't about experimenting and building a future. They were about optimizing their profits right now. Right. I've, I've found a, a couple of phrases recently that work great. Pro two agendas, profit over people and planet, yeah. which is what you're talking about, exactly. people and planet over profit, which is what we're hopefully working towards. I, and I have, I grew to have a little bit of, I used to believe in that ideal and, but I, the more I worked at high levels of organizations, the less I believed that they believed it. Possible. And, um, and so that was, I think that was one of the impetus, that was one of the motivations for me to, now in, in Christian studies, there's, there's studies of prophecy mm -hmm. and, and I, I, what bothered me about prophecy in, in most of the ways that most people taught it 
was it was evident to me that they they were including that the prophecy really has two pieces in a sense uh, it has an allegory and then it has an outcome and most of the emphasis for most teachers were on the allegory interpreting the allegories and i i thought that was highly problem probabilistic problematic in itself but i found that there was i could see consistent levels of biases in those interpretations well, it would seem biases. To a, a critical thinker incorporating the probability of some of these things being true right that science and allegory would have to dovetail at some point well i realized that most of the problem with allegory was that it was the prof, prof the, the person writing the prophecy's inability to describe how something would happen but only that something would happen mm -hmm. and so um I, 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 I wanted, I was always looking for a way of looking past the bias and there were cultural biases and racial, racial biases and nationalistic biases and, and um, re even religious biases that, you know, it's, it's us against the Pope or it's us, us against, you know, it's us against Islam. It's just the, and, and I, and I, I felt that all of those things had, were deeply flawed ways of analyzing what was going on. And at, there was a time that I actually, I was actually reading National Geographic at the time. And it was a particular set of studies dealing with the uh, radical decrease in, in the, the last, at that, that point, a short period of time of a couple of decades of fish stocks. And they were not just saying it's not just the East Coast, but it's in Europe, it's in um, um, Asia, it's in uh, Latin America. Uh, and it was basically a result of overfishing and pollution and fertilizers and activities of man. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were targeting, they were actually calculating fish stock decreases of 30% or more. And that struck in me a, a, a prophecy in Revelation called the Seven Trumpets that talked about a decrease of a third of the fish of the sea, third of the birds of the air, third of the beasts of the land, and third of the rivers being so polluted you couldn't drink from them. And I realized that, and I said, wait a minute, I've already read those studies in National Geographic and in, in some of the other environmental and other scientific magazines. I said, this isn't something that's going to happen just in our distant future by some, at the allegory was a, a flaming rock falling from the sky. This had already occurred. And it wasn't that the prophecy wasn't about God coming to destroy humanity, but as much as a warning of how humanity would destroy itself. And I said, well, wait a minute, if that's the case, if I stripped away the allegory in entirety, I forgot about the allegory, but I focused more on the outcome. What was the result of that? What's, what was it that said would happen? Has it happened? And I could calculate the probability of that happening. Right. Well, and there it, seems to be enough data that. from various sources to support pretty much any direction you would like to look at, and, and it would offer trending stats. Well, and I, I decided that I actually spent some time, I gathered up some data. Uh, I, I, we, I was with the oil company, so I had access to probably, you know, a highly sophisticated non-linear -regre regression algorithm tools and, and probability tools that the geologists would use for calculating the likelihood of finding oil here or there based on geologic data, that I could use these tools and I could use these, these this data that I collected through a dozen or couple dozen magazines to develop a probability model um, that what was the probability of these this uh, the fish uh, this happening what's the probability of this happening what's the probability and then what's the probability and I only took about 15 unique prophecies I thought well I could definitely get data to say that has happened mm -hmm. and what was the probability of all these things happening since 1947 1948 and at the end of a three-day weekend uh, where my son was at my ex-wife's house I came up with a probability that was one in 1.4 trillion against random chance. Now, at the time, I thought, well, either I, my math was really, really bad, or I was onto something, and that even if my, my calculations were off by a factor of 100, it was still an enormously large number. Well, and, and by the same token, this wasn't something that you were just stepping into. You had a history of developing models that were pretty darn accurate yeah and so it that that experience that exercise and curiosity mm -hmm. radical curiosity i'd say radical curiosity 
to say, well, it's not just the lunatic standing on the corner holding up a sign saying the end is near, but that I could, I could start using a new filter to basically look at the world, look at world events, look at politics, look at economics, look at social economic events and trends to start to understand what was happening to the world that I was so dissatisfied with and, and that in some ways would, would terrify most other people. Mm -hmm. It gave me a lens in order to analyze it and, and put it into a perspective. Now, are you also... Now that you you you're looking at this, are there other parameters such as other calendars and and what their uh, predictive qualities were, uh, their allegories to as you said earlier, such as the Mayan, the Sumerian, the Egyptian, the Hindu, or the Kali Yuga. Um, ironically, one of my books, uh, The Curse of Cortez, uh, dealt with, it started off, and it didn't start off looking at prophecy, but it ended up looking at mythology and prophecy of the Mayans. Mm -hmm. And um, I started off because I had written a short story for my son. And I, this was part of my learning how to exercise my creativity. I was a single parent. I had computers, but a lot of time, but no money to go anywhere because I was yeah. paying off debts. So you spent a lot of time in the creative space. And so I would, I basically decided that I would, he would love to read. So, and of course, kids love pirate stories and lost civilizations and lost treasures. And, and so I, I wrote him a story called Paolo and the Shark. And, and I was writing a sequel to it and was exploring real live, real historical lost treasures that I could use as a leverage. And the one I came up with was Henry Morgan. I, most people don't understand the story. I'll take it, take a little short detour. Raided the 1672, raided the city of Panama, took back a billion, billion and a half dollars worth of plunder and 600 slaves. But then he cheated all of his men, disappeared with almost the entire treasure on three ships. None of it ever seen again. But Morgan survived. Uh, ultimately, he was sent to England because he was a hero. They knighted him as Sir Henry Morgan. They made him lieutenant governor, gave him a garrison of soldiers, sent him back to Jamaica to get rid of piracy. But he went into this drunken, haunted, depressed debauchery, burned his logbooks before he died, so the world would never know the truth. Three years after he died, the whole city of Port Royal sank into the ocean, including his grave. The locals at the time say they've been cursed by Morgan. Hmm. Now, I was fascinated by that because I said, well, one, it's really harder than you think to lose 30 tons of stuff, three ships, and five or 600 souls without somebody finding something. And two, it didn't sink because he came back with an empty vessel. So it went someplace. Right. Three, something changed Morgan. Something traumatized him so badly that he would give up a billion dollar plunder and then hide, it, hide the truth. So that got me onto it. What took me well over a decade of researching what could have, first off, what could have happened to that treasure. And I won't go through the, all the sequences, but it, it tied into a discovery by Mitchell Hedges in 1911, but it tied back also I to- I met Anna. Big time? I met his daughter. Well, part of what he had, part of his story was that he was on this particular island called Roatan for seven years, dug up thousands of artifacts, claimed before he disappeared off that island that he had found Atlantis, and then showed up several months later in New York with $6 million, 1911 dollars, so it's like 250, 270 million today. Um, and when he, they asked him where he found the gold, he lied. Um, and so there was something about that island. And that got me researching the island and that island tied to an Inquisition massacre that ended a 2000 year pilgrimage to the island before the Spanish said, why are people canoeing 50 miles to get here over op open ocean? What's so special about this place that it's a pilgrimage? That got me looking at the geology of the island, the mythology of the island, the mythology of the Maya. I ultimately tied it back to the Mayan 5,000 year calendar and the Mayan creation myth. Now in their creation myth, they talk about being created and destroyed multiple times. Mm -hmm. And in the second destruction, and um, they was destroyed by a massive fire and then a flood. Mm -hmm. And I realized that the calendar, the 5,000 year calendar and their creation myth epochs lined up and that they were basically, count, the, the calendar was basically to count these large epochs of time where right. things, the world would change. Right. And the last epoch was their apocalyptic one that ended in 2012, which upon which they said there would be this darkness and deception that would follow the world. Now, in the second epoch where they and, were destroyed. And as I understand that, if I could 
take a moment to reflect this. Um, um, Jose Arguez was a good friend of mine before he had, uh, passed and brought a lot of that calendaric knowledge out. One of the things that we discussed was that after the escalation of consciousness and, and um, raising of awareness up to the solstice of 2012, then what, right? So the next phase of that basically is once that awareness is present, every you take it with you. So everywhere you go, there's a shift in vibration and that which doesn't match it will rise to the surface for reformation or review or uh, reconstruction or just elimination. Right. So that's the period that we're in now. Is well, all of the things that are coming to the surface. Destruction, I realized that that lined up directly with the Younger Dryas asteroid event in 12,900 years ago. And so they had actually described, so there was a civilization that had survived that event in Latin America and learned to tell about it and then write about it. And it became their mythology. Mm -hmm. And that tied into the Inquisition, then tied into Chalam Balam, who was the prophet who wrote about the end of the world prophecies for the Maya that would happen at the end of the fourth epoch, which ended in 2012. So the question that you were asking was, does this, does this align to other um, of faith yeah. systems and, and uh, of prophecy? And the answer was, it, it seemed to line up pretty well. So it, be, it gave me a new perspective of, of how to analyze prophecy without a lot of the um, overt bias dogma that you see out of many other places where it's taught. Well, that's usually and when it's it, it comes it from a specific events as opposed to allegories. Yeah, and, and, and regarding the the mess, right? That that's usually within the particular faith, mm -hmm. right? That that there's this reticence to take the larger view multiple perspective view through all of them simultaneously and then see what filters out as being consistent yeah and the other thing i realized so that one of the realizations was that prophecy was less about god destroying humanity as much as a warning of how he would do it to ourselves hmm. second thing i realized was that prophecy was really a bad tool to try and predict the future as opposed to try and understand events as they would occur to basically line up the the less what what was happening and then realizing how that would line up and then using that as a way of inner reflection to say well how am i supposed to respond what what's the response and, and the response is not to get an ar-15 the response is not to dig a bunker the response is not to go to war with the things that you think that are, are against you because it they, all of those things tend to fulfill the prophecy in itself yeah. um, the response was more of a spiritual response of saying well how do i change in order to be prepared for what's going on on a spiritual level um, because it was clear on all of them, one of the consistencies was that the world systems itself would be corrupt. And it wasn't a, it wasn't a lesson on how to correct the corruption in the world systems, but there were always lessons on how to basically respond as an individual. And this one indicated- so it started changing a lot of my thinking. It changed my priorities in my career. Uh, it changed my faith and, 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 and reinforced my faith in a lot of ways, but also gave me, help me to basically separate the way I would evaluate these things versus how a lot of churches would, would do it. Um, it changed my priorities around my, my family. It changed my priorities. It was part of this revelationary time period I had to go through to go from, to start healing those inner wounds and start to realizing what my own purpose might be. Um, and one of the reasons why I write now is because of multiple of these lessons. Now, I want to go back real quickly to a great story that ties into why I write about artificial intelligence in my stories along with prophecy. Mm -hmm. There was a, about the end of this period, and I had now met my second wife, um, who is, I'm still married to for 30 years. She's an absolute, she's, she's the angel sent into my life to, to balance me out and to keep me, keep me, keep me sane. And, and keep me connected to the the compassion and, and love and everything else in the world. And, and we come in with with basically two things that we need more than anything. That's to love and be loved. Yeah. 
And she, uh, for a long time after my first marriage, I had convinced myself that I was so bad in relationships that I should never, my first marriage was such a disaster. I should never do that again. <laughs> just, just, well, you know, we, it you does know, take it some worse. time to mature, right? It's easier to be lonely as a single guy than to be miserable as a married guy. So absolutely. Um, but so things have started changing. So one of the things in, in my constant reading and discovery and exploring things, I ran across an Associated Press article. So it told me that this was something that had some somebody looking over as an editor validating something of what it said. It was a very short article. It was one of those little blurbs you see in like Omni or one of the pseudoscience magazines. Sure. And it basically said, not kidding, a program has escaped the Lawrence Livermore Laboratories at Sandia. If I knew anything, contact this professor at the laboratories or this FBI agent in charge of the investigation. And I just did a full stop. I kept reading it over and over again, thinking I had read it wrong. And then I cut it out and I taped it on my monitor and I looked at it every single day for months. And I thought, this is either a typo, but because it didn't say a program was stolen, mm -hmm. didn't say it was lost, didn't say it was corrupted or that it had malfunctioned. The verb that it uses, a program had escaped. And in my head, now, first off, the Lawrence Livermore Labs at Sandia is an NSA spy lab. They do cryptology, they do signals, they created the Sexnet virus. It's basically, it's a spy lab for the NSA. Right. So I'm thinking a spy program escaped the NSA. That must be a pretty smart program, huh? It. They can't find it. They don't know where it went. And I'm thinking, well, okay, well, escape implies it, it, that it, it, they could even say they lost it, but they said escape. Well, that implies some level of intelligence and intent. It implied that it had the ability to move itself right. and then it more it felt trapped. It had the ability to race the, the log trails, the computer log trail, so that they didn't know where it went. I was like, wow, man, that is that is like hyper cool technology. So what was it designed to do that it had that high? First off, I wanted to figure out how they could do that. What were the technology architectures and technologies it used to do that? And it took me months to figure that out. But then I figured out once they figured out, okay, well, that's plausible. That's a plausible scenario. Um, what did they design? What did they create this James Bond, Q, James Bond spy program to do that it had that amazing self-moving, self you know, self-choosing stealth technology and so i came up with a number of other attributes i thought what i would want my perfect james bond program to do and about that time i had a close friend who was a film producer and we were always looking for ideas and so we talked about writing a screenplay doing a television pilot and i said well this is an internet based program i was pretty positive i said let's do a webisode series and so we hired some out of work actors we wrote scripts we created some artwork for the sets um, we, we did, I did the HTML, we produced this for 12 episodes, won about 25 different awards across the web. I had fans everywhere from Russia to China, to Israel, to Europe, to the NASA, uh, a, a guy from NASA who was one of our big fans. He was, his alias was orbit at nasa.gov. Um, and along about the, and we got optioned by one of the studios. And so the long about one this time, about two weeks before the option was due, two FBI agents showed up at my door. They were rather perturbed that I had figured out something they really were convinced should be top secret and wanted me to take the site down. Uh, now, I was I was jazzed. To me, it said, okay, I, I, I've nailed this. Right. My wife was freaking out. What did you do? Why are there two FBI agents in our dining room? And who are you? You know? <laughs> Well, geez, so, honey, I, I just put two and two together. I'm just, and, a, I'm and, just a nerd. I told yeah. you I'm a nerd. Right. Um, so they went to the studio and killed the deal. I lost a lot of money. I tucked my tail between my legs. Um, I had to go get a real job at that point. I think it was an Oracle or a startup. I can't remember exactly. But I never lost consciousness of how our, the, the advanced technologies I love to experiment with, the government loved to experiment with them too, but oh, yeah. their goals and objectives were radically different than mine. 
And it turns out in 2016, CNN reported that Russia had hacked the CIA cyber toolkit. And in that toolkit were virtually every one of the attributes I had assigned to this escaped program, including what we now call the deepfake video technology. So it confirmed that I not only was close, but I nailed it, which is probably why it freaked them out. Um, so, so what, should we be concerned about this? Well, that's one of the reasons I started writing my thriller books. And I, I like to write my thriller books based on real things that have happened, real technologies that are out there, real research that I do, and then trying to read between the lines a few times where I have to, to say, well, what are they using this for and how, what could happen? Mm -hmm. um, well, but, you yeah, know, because tools lot. can be used or abused. It depends on how you understand them. Artificial them intelligence right? could be a powerful, great tool that, you know, we're already using it to help detect cancer cells and CAT scans. We're using it to help manage projects better. We can use it in logistics. We can use it in a lot, um, material science, nanoscience, uh, pharmaceuticals. There are a lot of positive uses for the technology. Mm -hmm. But then I had to kind of come to the spiritual sense of saying, well, wait a minute. If prophecies are correct and we're living in a corrupted world, knowing what I knew about the greed of the corporations I had worked on, about the deceptions and the way they would spin the truth to basically serve their own means, could I, could I assume that our government or other governments were basically benevolent um, in their uses of these technologies? And I had to say, well, well, history shows that that's not, not, true. not true. So it, I, one of the reasons I write the books is to try and bring into context those lessons I had learned through corporate America, through my own experiments, through understanding how these technologies could be used to try and project um, scenarios. And I, in the, the book, the fictional part of the book, I had the program that escaped, I turned it into a character to give it a persona using the deep fake video technologies to give it a persona that it used to personify. And that program has now decoded end time prophecy in a similar type of approach that I had used to decode end time prophecy and is trying to warn others of what we're moving ourselves into while all the other characters are somewhat agnostic, just trying to understand what's wrong with the program. Um, but feeling, sensing that it's been right about so many other things trying to understand what it's trying to tell them. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to use it as a way of, of creating awareness, not to do it in a dog in a dystopic way, because the characters are smart, they're witty, they're, 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 there's a great, uh, they're, um, they're very concerning and caring as individuals and as the characters, but they're confronted with the fact that they've got this now rogue program who's, going in this strange direction they didn't anticipate and um and trying to use that as a, as a filter to look at things like climate to look at um things like um the recent rise in in more fascist and autocratic governments even within america and europe to look at some of the places where our science is going awry um to look at um, world economic systems, including the World uh, Economic Forum desire to create a digital currency and, and what kind of, how that level of control could be used uh, adversely. Well, and we were also, which is a really impending awareness, I guess, would, would be a good phrase for that, that we need to have in order to move forward and not to have it so that we've become all frightened and skittish and scared of each other like we were through the pandemic, just the opposite. We need to come closer and say, okay, this, and it's my opinion, and it seems to be what's happening is that there are those who have risen out of the pandemic and saying, hey, you know, we do need to consider this. And what I also know on a vibrational level with electronics that because it's in that cyberspace capacity, it is accessible to non-human intelligence as well. And that activity, from my understanding and from everything, all, all the contactees and books that I've read and things, the, the, the clear message is we need to learn to get along to work together better because we are one people sharing one planet until we actually get that 
there's not a whole lot that's going to change. However, that can right. happen. And it doesn't have to happen through control and manipulation. This is something that acquiesces from the nature of us wanting to love and be loved. Well, and one of the themes in the book is that we, as of today, without any other changes, we have all of the intellectual capacity, all of the tools, all of the finances, all of the people resources to solve every single one of the problems facing humanity from lack of food, lack of water, lack of housing, education, starvation, um, as disease. Um, if we the only thing, but we, we don't do a lot of it because of the lack of unity. But we don't know how, right? There's no we one that's saying, how. we have all Here's the a model that we might consider that works, or let's figure out how to do this, find people that smarter than we are, you know, like Ron Reagan did, but when he was president, right? He right. said, I just find people smarter than me and, and, and I turn them loose, right? right? And that's essentially, this is all seeming to be like you, your journey. It's self-initiating, yeah, right? It's this willingness to step up, whether it's from a spiritual place, from a rational place, from a logical place, from a deep emotional place, that it just all has that sense of moving into a different, almost a new time scenario, like Jose mentioned with the uh, Mayan calendar, where you've had this escalation of consciousness that's coupled with the solar system moving into a new area of space, right? The age of Aquarius. Well, what's the shift that takes place in that on a very subtle energetic level? And then what's the trickle through mm -hmm. on a planetary scale as well as a human scale? Because there are those factors that we don't consider. And maybe this program actually is kind of helping to facilitate that process. Helping to at least raise awareness and, 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 and look at all of these holistically of how all these things are connected. Right. Now, um, and it's, I, I, for some people, these kinds of conversations are very um, frightening. Uh, I happen to think that it's um, an honor and a privilege to live in such a unique time in all of history. Right. That I totally agree with you there. It, it's an honor, a privilege. It's humbling. And humbling. the, the real ability that we have to let go and step into and I, I call it a perfected form fit and function because as we're I mentioned uh, Valentina Morovina mm -hmm. to you earlier the Russian academician who studied the science behind this global mutation that's happening in humanity it's a biospiritual event that has scientific proof that it's happening so this is that moving upward in our realms of interactive capacity with each other beyond the fear or the prescriptive narratives that's been placed on us throughout our recent past that has said that there's an enemy out there somewhere and we need right. to protect ourselves right now the challenge becomes that while we have all this capability to um affect all of humanity we also have a history where humanity sometimes needs the crisis mm -hmm. the horrific crisis in order to get past all of those um to get past all of those impediments in order to do so and who but a few saw the pandemic coming and that could just be one of the crises <laughs> yes. right that could just be one of them we see the war in ukraine escalating and well, that's localized, though. That's still localized. This was the right now, that's was a global event. But it has the potential of exploding into a global event because if Putin, Putin is a, if Putin realizes that he's going to lose, and I've seen a number of different analyses by different people that that, that his potential of actually using a nuclear um, um, uh, weapon in order to gain a hand is 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 not out of the realm of possibility. Well, that's a Western thinking, in my opinion, because I've done a lot of research and my wife's from Russia. We've got a lot of Russian folks that, that are have been in, in high higher places. And there's a different mentality that the Westerns don't understand about the Russians. And they're not there to harm people. That's never the their intent. I don't think this is a Russian problem. I think it's a Putin problem. 
you know, it, that could be, however, um, in what he got when he took over in the state of Russia now, he is to be commended for what he's been able to do with the country. Um, there are, I mean, the facts are he's rebuilt it in, in a lot of different ways. Um, but, and that's, those are facts. The, just look that's at the true. economy and what's going on. Okay. But he's done it in a now, corrupt kind of economic environment where he's basically- And we don't. Oligarchs. And, and we don't in the states and corporations and, and I, how I, the I, political I, system I, is run. I, but, you know, I think I it's a to, kettle black. But there are other however, tools for however, this to basically create, become into a global environment. And again, these are ways that where we put our attention that it really doesn't need to be. What we need to put our attention on is how we can work together to resolve this, to move forward and drop the fear of it happening. Correct. But I don't think that part of that is giving him a country that he, that, that he's basically invaded for no reason. So, um, no, it wasn't, but here's those were Russians, guy. Okay? Those were originally Russians. Kiev was the original capital of Russia. So, they the, basically the culture and the history of that land to live at an independent level. That's not, it wouldn't be us to basically say that you should go and that's a political level again, right? These are political choices, not necessarily the culture and, and the roots of the people. And there was a time when when Ukraine was an own it, it, an independent state. It became part of the Soviet Union, so it there is a long history there. Mm, yeah, right. Ukraine, <laughs> I think that people have the right to basically determine their own future and their own government. And I, I don't think any I don't think the United States or anybody else has the right to go in and say no, you're going to be ruled by some by, by us. So I think there's some complicated issues there. Absolutely, and, and things that, that we don't understand. People will that. always suffer first more than the rulers. No. Um, but I have to look at the mentality of a guy like Putin to say, well, what is he capable of pushed into the corner? And so if you look at some well, of here's these... A, here's a scenario. Just in the beginning of the pandemic, he sent... Um, I don't know how many supplies and staff to Italy to help them handle their pandemic situation. Mm -hmm. Now, would a leader that would, uh, would would consider pushing the button for releasing a bomb do that kind of activity? I don't think so. Well, I, I think that would seem... Um, But he's also then inconsistent. I'll put it that way. Poisoned or imprisoned any adversary that comes up to 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 th threaten his rule. So I, I I'm not going to give him give him the the benefit of the doubt on his benevolence, given the fact that he's been so malevolent on so many occasions. Well, I, I totally agree with you at, with you on that. However, um, I, I think there is credit due to to the rebuilding process, even though it may have been done in ways that we wouldn't necessarily from our moral perspectives. And, and I think that's the reason why so many of our, and I think that was trying to, we've, we've given that to him over the time, basically. And that was why we had so many economic um, um, relationships with him on so many company levels, corporate levels and, and governmental levels until he basically decided that he was going to um, devastate the Ukrainian people go after their citizens, bomb their their apartment buildings. Well, basically. wasn't you know I've heard I from from people. some reports that when they first invaded, it, it was because of a couple of provinces that wanted to rejoin Russia, and that they were being attacked by Ukrainian forces, and the Russians actually created kind of um, transition tunnels or migration tunnels for the refugees to get out of the area. Uh, and protected them in doing so. So those kinds of things, you know, th granted, we are so marginalized in the information that we receive from the media. It, it's, we could go all kinds of different directions. Yeah. Let's just say that well, there's this opportunity for us to step back, kind of look at things, see what's going on, and then choose a better path from which we can learn how to deal with it because it, it is a devastated area it's going to take time to recover it, it's not the first time something like that has happened around the world because of uh, conflicting opinions and what do we do next what would you how would you suggest that we take this information 
and distill it within and do something positive with it. Well, it's not even just Russia. I look at our own corporate uh, positions. I look at how climate change has now been kicked down the road, mm -hmm. you know, the can down the road for now decades to the point where we're, we've already th crossed in some of the initial thresholds to basically avoid some of the worst, um, some of the bad um, outcomes of, of that, that event. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, as I said, I think a lot of this is, I think we have the potential of radical change, but I, I don't think we're going to avoid, I think we're past the point where we can avoid a painless process. <laughs> I would agree right. with that. So how, the, back to the question. So what will that pain, what form will that pain come in? And that's that's where I try not to speculate because it could, it could go in a lot of ways. And I'm not, However, I don't have how we deal more. with that. I don't have, but I, I don't think we're in a position where we could rein in corporations in terms of their um, practices of pollution and, 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 and abuse of the environment. I, I think that we're in a lot, we're, we've got a lot of uh, things working together. Now, in a prophetic sense, it says that there will be a climactic period before it becomes a peaceful period. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, you always have to be, have chaos before order, and yet it's the natural process from chaos to order. Now, we're in a place, in my opinion, where, like uh, Matthias DeMott said in uh, Tucker Carlson's interview recently, that what even with all the marginalization from the narratives, and, and uh, we're still finding that place where we're recognizing what we're really seeking is positive, empathic resonance. And that's what's guiding us from within, is what and feels right to do. There, uh, what, I, what I'm discouraged about is that the people who have that mindset are not necessarily the people in power to basically make that change happen yet. So we will get a change. Now, one of the things you, you we brought up earlier, some of the, the aspects of um, the newer phenomenons of governments um, recognizing, at least admitting that, that um, UAPs are, are real. Right. We don't really understand what they are, that they are more likely interdimensional than interstellar um, uh, based on just the logistics of, 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 of light years between galaxies. Um, that, that there's now... And there's a great quantum physics or quantum uh, reality theory that Nepian Close posted or posed in 2010 called the triadic dimensional distinction vortical paradigm in which they... Uh, posit that consciousness, space, and time is, are tethered across nine dimensions mm -hmm. for the human experience. That doesn't mean there are any more. There aren't any more dimensions. It's just we're limited to that in our realm. Well, of string being. theory postulated there were eleven dimensions. So let's just say that some of those dimensions could explain some of what we would call spiritual realm, right? right. Different vibrational frequencies that Great we can. Frequencies, some, different levels of perception to be we can't hear certain frequencies we can't see certain wavelengths you know there there are uh there are aspects apparently some can right we've been calling them psychics and witches and weirdos and all kinds of stuff over the years and right prophets. and and so yeah, exactly there are prophecies that talk about um a um the coming of the lord with his angels and that would have a, a main meaningful impact on the transition of the world from this, our current transition into a new one. Mm -hmm. So it's possible uh, that that is part of what might happen. Uh, can you imagine now if we were all of a sudden able to see all, all of these other interdimensional beings or, or ships and uh, with capabilities far beyond our own, um, that we're now at least admitting to at a governmental level that we've somehow known about. I mean, you look back at middle, um, the art of the Middle Ages, they, there were some of these uh, um, 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 vehicles depicted in art. If you look back on old biblical and other prophetic um, from, from the India, uh, Indian, um, uh, and I mean- They've been India, around. Uh, they, they've been around. Uh, if there was a, if you look back on some of the Mayan prophecies, we, we see some of this evidence um, or uh, my mythologies, rather, we see some of this evidence um, that would have a transitional effect on the world uh, as well. So let's say that that if it might that might be the catalyst to change us to basically move us away from this sort of um, um, 
corporate or it might be the result of the acquiescing to a higher vibrational level in ourselves because as we ascend in consciousness as we open ourselves up to that unknown that nothingness the unconditional love mm -hmm. that we're supposed to carry that changes our frequency now that also changes our ability to perceive mm -hmm. because we've made that ascension if you will in, in vibratory levels which affects our entire being so that in effect would seem to have hold the possibility of allowing us to see these things more often or experience them and perhaps even begin to and i think the difference is is because and I, again i think i don't see that as the dominant trend in our social economic political systems no, not, at see, least not now, because we're not there. But what I do see is that the people who are more inclined in that direction, um, are more sensitive, who are more spiritual, will be more prepared for this transition when it might happen. No, so that preparation. That people that are better prepared for, just as in any chaos, there are those who really, um, who you would never think of being, um, being leaders or being dominant in, in a certain in one environment become so in another environment mm -hmm. and it could be that the, those are the people that will basically make this transition more successfully than the others who immediately want to pull out their ar-15 and shoot at them <laughs> well i see that just as like, being just like we saw people wanting to shoot at a balloon you know it, right right well, we'll check this out. See if some of those actions are really beyond my comprehension but that's those are the people who would not do well during this kind of transition oh sure and, and those from my opinion because i'm always i'm like the eternal optimist that you know folks like to poke fun at um and i don't mind because it, it's okay. still, I, i'm still there right better better that's a good thing to do to be oh yeah i, I think so and, and i'm still realistic right mm -hmm. you know having a couple of master's degrees in business doesn't mean that i'm a wacko exactly. I, I have a real good understanding of the hard and soft skills that we need to have in order to facilitate people places and things to do stuff at any level mm -hmm. so that being said when you have these uh the combinations the synergies of the rise in vibration of the skill set that the individual has developed over their lifetime and their capacity to implement that in new ways as they are called to do for lack of a better right the, because that's a sense we can't think our way through a system built on vibration we've got to sense our way through it or feel our way through it and that's something that we're moved to do rather than something that we think about oh i, I want this you know, I, uh, as an entrepreneur, I've got this goal, I've got this vision, I'm going to back out the steps to get there. It's the same kind of process. However, the, those steps are laid out in front of us once we make the choice to move into them, mm -hmm. or so it seems. Do you, do you find that pattern um, consistent in your life as well? Well, it's certainly been consistent in my life, and I think it reinforces the concept for me that it has to start on an individual level and that we have to then have whatever realm of influence we have to be the that's where we can we have we have influence, you know, that whatever the realm is. And some have a bigger realm of influence than others, right? Um, my realm of influence is is I wouldn't say it's 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 great. I have my business community who now are seeing me become an author. I have the people reading my books who are responding extremely well to the themes of, yes, this is the world we live in, but there's something else going on here that we don't maybe don't quite understand yet, but we need to maybe pay more attention to. Right. Um, and through the series of the books, I'll be talking about some of these other larger issues and, and, and including the interdimensional beings and how that might be part of prophecy as well. And what is that? What is that transition leading us towards? Um, my 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 realistic probability analysis says that we still have the influence of the, uh, and I'll just call them the the Bilderberg. Um, How about the oligarchs? Are, yeah, we we basically have that influence over economic systems. And they're not likely to give up easily and 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 absorb this sort of um, um, perspective 
easily. And so I do think that we will have to, based on history, yeah. we will have to go through some sort of tra chaotic transition time. A groundswell and of activity that disrupts the people positivity. that are focused on the out the other end of that, the other side of that transition, as opposed to absorbed with the fear of the chaos itself, mm -hmm. will do better. And it's there will be a even... number of people who will, the ones absorbed, you know, caught up in their Twitter and their celebrity, you know, idolization and their love of money and their love of their, you know, there are people who will not make that transition well. Right. And okay. it's unfortunate, but there are a number of those people. And, and you know, there's an interesting, um, in uh, Charles Schwab's, not, not Charles, um, COVID-19, the Great Reset. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He asked a great question that kind of has a two-edged sword to it, and this is what you're alluding to. Will we be caring and compassionate towards each other coming out of the, of the pandemic? Right? Now, one side of the fence would say, mm, not going to happen, which is going to allow us to continue our command and control activities because you're sheep. The mm -hmm. other side of the fence is, yes, we can be caring and compassionate, and it's going to take less people to create more change than what you could imagine. And I'm more of the quantum uh, approach to it, which is yes and both. <laughs> right? Yeah. Both are yeah. true. And yeah. we're seeing both occur. Yeah, yeah. We're seeing people coming out of well, the pandemic. One's not going to go away. Just, you know, it's not going to be a sweeping magic wand change. Yeah. It's going to be a transition that's going to be arduous by any stretch of the imagination. It's going to be both. Yeah. And I'm not convinced that the pandemic in and of itself was the ultimate transition. Oh, no, no, no. Trigger. Um, trigger. Or trigger. It was about all it was, but it gave us the chance. And this is what I told my wife when we went on lockdown here. I really hope this gets people based on the obsession on self-hygiene and sequestration and behavior mod. Mm -hmm. right? So the carry through from that gets people to turn inside and start talking to themselves because they've got nobody else. Right. Unless right. they were online in virtual space or stuff like that. But still, there's this downtime that you get a chance to sit and reflect. Well, and I think that's you? when I look at when I look at prophecy, once you start understanding how to interpret the prophecy outcomes. So, for example, the pandemic itself fits into a prophecy of the seven seals, mm -hmm. which talks about a global pestilence or pandemic. Right. Uh, which and even if you look back in history even the black plague was localized to europe it wasn't yeah. didn't affect the americas didn't affect africa didn't affect asia um even the spanish flu of the 19 uh, 1917 affected mainly us and europe didn't affect most other people but because of international travel because of our global nature our, our global commerce now things that can start in china in one week and be in america the next week um or the next day right and so but it, that was part of that, that prophecy. Now, I believe the prophecy is there not to say this is the, this is the, the end itself, but that's yeah, not all oh, was me. It's like, oh, okay. way yeah, it's opportunistic that we should be, that we should be growing in awareness of so that we understand that this time of, of, of radical transition is, is, is coming sooner than later. Right. And, and as I said, it's an opportunistic moment rather than um, a fearful one. Exactly. And I think that's the lesson that I try to bring out in the books, that, that these are the warning signs for us to be better prepared. Uh, and that preparation is not is, is starts as an internal spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and that's how we get to that, so that we're ready for that transition. And so I, I think that... The, um, I don't look at these things as ends of themselves as part of that. When I look at it and I realize, okay, well, that's, that's an event that's never happened. That's now happened. The probabilities are a bit unlikely that it would happen, except now it has. And so we can count, we can basically check that one off saying, what are the other things we should be aware of possibly happening that are also warning signs for this coming, coming uh, transition. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's more about trying to be say, uh, and I, I think that, I think that they're, you're right, which is that we have to look at the positive potential, uh, but not be blind to the fact that there's going to be um, unpleasant things that will right. toward right. that positive potential. Well, 
And for you, it, it's been the back of the things that exist now in order to recreate. And to recreate in a much more positive or even create in a much more positive way. It's not, you know, everything's already there. We just got to put the things together. Right. Um, for you, it's being able to put that in the books. For me, it's doing this show. And, and as a result of doing this show, having the opportunity to step in leadership, a co-director leadership role of yeah. the global peace movement. Yeah. And, you know, is this prophetic too? Or, you know, we've got, and the two aspects of it. So the, the live and let live philosophy has two principles in it, live and let live. The live, we call the be a good human. And mm -hmm. there's an unpacking of that in, in many ways, shapes and form, which gives opportunity for conversation and reflection and, and building community. And then the let live side, we say, you know, it's be peaceful. It's not aggression. And our long-term goal is to remove all law that allows aggression. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a really practical, pragmatic, kind of hard-nosed and, and yet very specific activity that most people don't want to get involved with because people hate politics at this point, right? <laughs> they, they, just, they run from them. And yet, these are the very things that we need to be involved with in order as a people to move this new agenda of people and planet over profit into the forefront. Yeah, well, I absolutely agree with that. I, I was a um, product of um, aggression as a child. I, I saw gun use in a very negative way, even before the AR-15 was dominant. Right. Um, and I don't, no matter how bad it gets, I refuse to own a gun because I'd, I'd rather die as a peaceful man than, than, than live as a violent one. Right. Um, and, um, but there are minds there, there are, that's not a universal uh, approach. It, it would, it's a battle. It's going to be a battle to basically overcome the, uh, the lobby, uh, the aggression lobby, mm -hmm. as I would put it. Both, not only with the NR with the NRA. Well, those are the profit over people and planet people. Military complex, right? right? Um, and it's not something that we can do. Um, there's a danger in doing it unilaterally unless we can bring others along. I was very encouraged when we started developing um, um, nuclear non-aggression treaties. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of those treaties are now in trouble. Um, there's a global harmony association that has been going for at least a decade and a half, maybe two decades, uh -huh. um, countless numbers of scientists and, and academians and people that are on the same wavelength. Uh, and it's actually the president's, um, lives in St. Petersburg as well. Uh, I can't remember his last name, Leo, um, was just recognized as one of their men of the year in the yeah. efforts that they're making toward I think there's individuals of every nation who would align with that yeah I, absolutely no question about that there are individuals in every nation individuals in every faith um and 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 spiritual belief system that would align with that mm -hmm. um the question is how do we how do we then um either unempower or or um for lack of a better word, evangelize. Um, and I know that's got a lot of baggage to it, but 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 change um, those who yeah, semantics can be such a uh, yeah mess. Uh, but lack, as I said, lack of a better word. Um, yeah. And uh, baggage aside, how do we how do we change those who are uh, diametrically opposed to those goals? Well, one of the things, just as an answer, when you've got a system that's built for use of the public that hasn't necessarily been using it well because they've been manipulated by the power and the money and the prestige and all that kind of stuff. However, to get them reinterested in even just a simple philosophy like live and let live, right? And that simple agreement on that philosophy unifies people to then begin to say, okay, now what's our next step? How can we work together here? How can we work together uh, virtually? How can we learn how to work together regionally and internationally and just and nationally? And these are things that as these activities develop, that we can uh, even bring forth where we've got a social enterprise concept where we help people do peace events and earn money 
with that so that they can feel some prosperity in their locations. And we've got everything to help them do so. Part of our expertise is running large events so we can we've mapped out situations to help them so it's a hand-holding process which is really what we need to do we need to all learn how to hold hands and share the skill sets and the activities the, the materials the processes templates all those kinds of things that that we have maybe in some cases been hoarding waiting for the right moment to share that now we've got this capacity to do so and perhaps with all of these um prophetic fulfillments that you're seeing maybe that's what's in process well i certainly think that some of the uh, elevated anxiety is is moving people more in in the direction of how how do we how do we counter this on some level and i think mm -hmm. some of the some of the events some of the activities some of the legislative um proposals maybe even though they haven't been accepted yet at least they're, they're gaining some more some greater prominence um i think the um Banning assault weapons is a step in the right direction. I think more treaties around peace. I, I believe that we should be signing more uh, treaties with artificial intelligence to avoid um, uh, lethal autonomous weapons. Mm. Uh, and right now, China, the, Russia, the U.S., Iran, North Korea, the the, the 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 actors who have a tendency of putting a lot of money in in, in weapons have refused. But there are 140 countries who have said yes. We need to do this. Uh, and so uh, there, I, I think there's still a, I, I, I think that's one of the things I learned in, in getting through some of my own transitions was that you need to do the right thing, regardless of if others are going to support that or if you see an immediate outcome. The fact you, you need to start by defining what the right thing to do is. And for me, for long, it, it, it changed as I, as I had to change myself. But pursuing that with vigor was the most important thing without necessarily trying to define what the outcome of that would be. Right. That's the best advice that I think anybody could give anyone uh, for this process. And I thank you for that. And it's a great segue to close with. We have been going far longer than normal. And it oh, has wow, been yes, exciting. Have. Um, wonderful conversation alone uh, it's been a wonderful conversation guy i really appreciate it and, and it's good to talk to someone of your caliber caliber easy for me to say and exchange the kind of ideas and reflections that we have well, thank you so really much that's been a very interesting conversation and thank you for having me on your show and and uh best of luck to you in your new role uh and, and executive role and um I, I hope we stay in touch we will and thanks again, Guy. Thank you, sir. I'll have, you, have your information below the video for those that are watching. And namaste and in la catch. Thank you for sticking with us for this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and I'll see you next time.